Okay, thank you, Sarah. Uh, thank you, folks. Um, I'm Rudy Hippolyte. I'm the producer director of the film. And I really appreciate everyone joining, joining us uh, today. And um, sorry, we couldn't show the entire film, uh, but we're under contract for dis distribution. So we really cannot, but it is available. And I, I hope that uh, if you guys want, it, want would like to see the rest, it's available on different platforms, which at some point Sarah can share. Um, again, thank you so much for joining, you know, being with us uh, today. I have uh, a couple of my uh, colleagues from the film here with us uh, uh, this evening, and we're looking forward to answering your questions or just having a conversation about some of the issues dealt with in the film, but also some of the issues that we're dealing with as a, as a society in our neighborhoods, there's a plethora of things we're dealing with. So I definitely would love uh, to discuss that. But before I introduce um, Donald and Tasha, and I think Malik, the music composer may show up at some point. I wanted to thank Sarah and David Harris for inviting us. They've been uh, incredibly supportive of the film and um, and this is the second time they brought us back uh, to share the film. So I really appreciate that type of support. Um, Donald uh, Osgood, uh, he's in the film and is a youth advocate, but Donald, I would love you to kind of introduce yourself briefly and talk about you know, what you're presently doing and then Tasha after you. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> I know a few few people came in after I spoke earlier, but um, my name is Donald Osgood, and yes, I used to work at Street Safe Boston. Um, I still believe it's one of the best programs we had in the city of Boston. Like one of the young brothers was saying that um, when we when we did the work, we stopped a lot of shootings, a lot of stabbings. Um, from from that role, I moved into the city of Boston street worker program as an interrupter. So we did a little bit of the same work, but not as intense. And from there, I went to the Lewis D. Brown Peace Institute. Um, you know, work with families in that first 24 to 72 hours of a homicide. And like my journey there from street safe. I used to also not only work with gangs, but I also worked at the hospital responding to shootings and stabbings. And so I saw a lot of families. I know a lot of people in Boston and a lot of people who passed away. And so I always wondered what, what happened to the families after, you know, like what was the follow-up like? So from, interrupters to the Peace Institute. I actually got to work with a lot of families in that first 24 to 72 hours. And now my new role at the Boston Health Commission is a senior program manager. I work for the children, adolescent family health and their violence prevention. And so my role is to monitor all incidents from beginning of community violence until all who are impacted by violence are receiving their healing. You know, so our, our website there is neighborhoodhealing.com. And we just we just want to make sure that we don't repeat the 80s and 90s, you know, and, and that's that'll be the last thing that I say. Um <clears throat> while I was working at the Peace Institute, oh yeah, it's a lot. A lot of things, but as of, when I was working at the Peace Institute, my first few months, a young man had passed away and I actually knew his dad and his dad had died to violence when he was just five years old. And then he came through at the same age his dad died and he left two children. And then there's a couple of young men in the film um, it just kind of shifted my mood because one of them was killed not even a year ago. Um, and his progress was just 
so unbelievable. You know, he, he had become a dad, had custody of his children, was a week away from moving into his own place with his kids and, you know, his life was taken. So, you know, one of the reasons that I stay doing this work is because I definitely want to see more young people make it. Um, yeah, that's what I have until someone has questions and I'll pass it to Tasha. Thank you. Um, my name is Tasha Carrington and my son, Darian Carrington, who was my only child, was killed January 8th, 2008, as he waited in the Chinese restaurant for his food, which was just around the corner from home. He was coming from my father's house. So here we are 13 years later and we still don't know who killed Darian. Um, for my first 10 years after Darian's death was really, really a dark place for me. And 10 years later, I walked into the doors of the, Peace, the Louis D. Brown Peace Institute. And from that day on um, in 2018, I've been on my healing journey. The Peace Institute has been a tremendous help for me on a personal level. For me, I was raised in the church and I had a, a my family was a village. I had a village that raised me. I had that same village to help raise my son. My son was 18 at the time and Darian was a good kid. I had Darian in the church. He was in the choir. He was on the usher board from the age of six. He was a member of the Roxbury Boys and Girls Club. He, always, he was always surrounded with love. And just so happened my father lived on Center Street, which is in the same area as St. Joe's and Warren Gardens and everything. Um, I have a baby brother who's actually a little bit younger than my son was. Um, so my son spent a lot of time over there with my father and my stepmother and his uncle, my little brother. So that's where he started to make new friends outside of his friends at school, at the Boys and Girls Club and at the church. And just so happened the church that I was raised in, that Damien was raised in, is actually across the street from Warren Gardens. So I'm on a journey now as to my healing and I'm definitely in a better place now than where I was when my son was first taken. Um, I continued to just live life. Every, I didn't even take time off from work. Once I buried my son, I could, I just didn't know what to do. I went right back to work. I was the supervisor over the youth choir at my church. I went right back to being with those children. They, to this day, I am still bonded with those. They're not children anymore, but I still call them my children, my babies. I'm still bonded with them. And it keeps me going. But what I'm saying now is that I'm now in a fight for justice. I don't know what the police are doing as far as my son's case. And I've been, I'm fighting, I'm fighting, I'm fighting because somebody needs to be held accountable for taking my son's life. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tasha. I see that uh, Malika has joined us again in order to do any film, it takes, you know, uh, a team, a collaboration. And so Malik is uh, created all of the music. It's all original music, which you, I think you had a chance to sample some of that. Malik, you want to briefly give, uh, uh, give an introduction of uh, your work? I think you're muted, Malik. Hey, sorry about that. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Malik Williams. How are you, Sarah? Haven't seen you in a long time. Nice to be here with everyone today. Um, I'm, I'm originally from Dorchester, um, Dorchester, Boston, Roxbury, 
as well growing up. Uh, I'm a composer producer. Um, I'm into education as well and also an, an advocate um, in regards to um, this. I kind of grew up around this, these same issues that we um, talk about in the film as well. And so through music, I've been able to kind of use that as um, kind of a vehicle to be able to get this message out and kind of create some change that way. Um, so overall, professionally, um, in regards to education, working with the Audio Engineer Society and working with other organizations in different colleges um, to kind of get that uh, educational um, word out in, in regards to different paths and avenues that people can, can take. Um, and in regards to music, trying to create more of a, a, a career for themselves um, instead of just kind of, you know, doing it for just entertainment because it is attractive. So I do find that a lot of younger people and people on a street level will kind of gravitate towards that. Um, again, I'm one of those those kids that kind of grew up in that same environment. A lot of my friends aren't here anymore um, due to these same issues. So, um, but that's pretty much my, my story um, in regards to, you know, kind of my professionalism and even being on here today and really being interested in what everyone else's stories are as well. So thanks Thank for you. having me. Thank you, Malik. Um, Sarah, I, we look forward to taking questions. I'm not sure how you'd like to, um, to moderate today, but before we go on, I just want to acknowledge another person from our team, Meredith uh, Westrup. She came on board and has been helping us with publicity, getting word out about the film and has been able to garner a lot of publicity for us. So again, the film is out there. It, it's, uh, it's a local film that is now national. It's actually available in North America through all of the platforms. So I hope that, uh, uh, that you can you know, tell others about the film, because again, we're an independent film company. I also want to thank, I see my daughter, Leanna, is joining us from California and my son, Walter. So thank you for the support and uh, look forward to taking your questions and having a conversation. As we stated at the beginning, we, we uh, on purpose made this a, a community meeting rather than a closed forum. So uh, if people have questions that they like to unmute themselves and go ahead and just ask or uh, be in conversation. If anyone has anything they'd like to put in the chat, I'm happy to read out questions for people who aren't comfortable um, being on um, on screen. So, you know, one of the, the big questions tonight that David Harris left us with was just that, you know, the, the, the relevance and the impact of so many issues that you bring up uh, in the film. Uh, and one of them, of course, that, that was most hitting home today was the regarding gun control that was in the Boston Globe this, um, uh, this morning. So I don't know if, if Rudy, if you wanted to start us off thinking about how that kind of uh, immediate relevancy it is being seen daily in, in, um, in, the, in the work that you do and then on the streets um, that we live on. Yeah, um, yeah, maybe Donald, you can speak to some of the, I mean, we've, we've unfortunately seen this week what has happened in terms of gun violence in Florida and Colorado. Uh, it's unfortunate, again, uh, those issues are dealt with in the film, but maybe Donald, before you do that, I just wanted to say we were supposed to have our co-director, uh, I'm sorry, our co-producer, Dennis Wilson. Uh, we had some technical problems, so he apologizes for not uh, being here, um, but he's a, a integral part of our team um, and is a real community activist. So uh, he sends his apologies. Donald, do you want to speak a little to uh, what has uh, transpired? So also I'm a part of the Mass Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence. Well, and we're working on a lot of you know, legislation as well to um, you know really get a get a hand on the violence, you know, gun violence in particular. Um, yeah, reforms 
אין. You know, I have a, I have a, um, a, I've been thinking about, you know, I'm going to talk about one of the laws that we talking about, passing, like expanding the um, quarry checks and things like that. But I've been doing a lot more research and homework. When you think about guns coming into the neighborhoods, there's really no law that can stop the community violence that we have because those guns are not registered guns. You know, they're, they're um, <laughs> guns that trickle in, however they trickle in, but they're not, you know, they're not um, legal guns. And so even expanding the quarry is just things I'm thinking about when you think about the root of a lot of you know, what our society is, is in, um, it's gonna have a negative impact on the black and brown young men and young ladies that are trying to get jobs. So I feel like we need to look at that a little bit different. Um, when we talk about the police reform, you know, there's a lot of things that were left out. And thank you, Senator Brownsberger, for, you know, working on that, you know, with the reform piece. But there's some some key some key nuggets that need to be added really make the community safe for everyone and not just a few folks you know when we talk about gun violence um, so i just have a lot just thinking about the young man who lost his life last year is it, bothering me because he you know let me say this senator brownsburg you can work on this please my I'm my listening. thought is if we had a law, right? Because I think this law would stop some of the guns coming into my community and all the other communities where violence is happening, right? If we had a law that would hold people accountable who buy legal guns, right? And then when those legal guns are missing, say five years, two years, six months, three months, one month, and that gun that they purchased that they didn't tell law enforcement that that gun was missing or stolen or whatever the case is, right? That there would be a law put in place that if that gun was used in a homicide, then the owner of that gun is accountable as well as the person that actually did the shooting. And I feel like if we did more of that type, those types of laws, because we understand, you know, people are buying guns legally in different states. You know, you can go right across the border there to New Hampshire and purchase some guns. And then there's no accountability on that end. But if we had a, a system that said, you know what? You didn't let us know that your gun was stolen. You're gonna do some of this time that the actual person did that did the crime. And I think that would actually slow down those guns coming into the inner city because these young men, they don't have jobs and there's not really a lot of drug money out there like it used to be in the 80s and 90s when we talk about the crack epidemic. But these young guys have guns that probably cost 500 plus dollars. So that's just something I've been thinking about, you know, some things that I, you know, I talk freely with, with the coalition because you know, we want to be able to be effective long term. You know, we want to be able to use our voice to change some things that will matter because, you know, this film is so heavy too. And you think about Jordan, you know, with his daughter and this young man, you know, he wants to be a dad, but, you know, the streets, once you're caught in the streets, it's almost impossible to get out and, you know, if there's no guns filtering in, I feel like a lot of these young folks wouldn't need to carry weapons because they're not carrying them just to kill. Some of them are carrying so that they can stay alive too. So this is my thoughts on some of that stuff today. Yeah, again, if, if anyone has any comments, again, this should be a conversation and I, we appreciate, it means you're interested in 
in this, this, these issues that are happening within our city and outside. And, uh, um, you know, Senator or Saeed, who, if you guys or anybody, uh, if you have any particular comments or questions, we'd love you to share them. You know, this is, uh, for me, this film is, you know, speaks to some of the things that I, I think about a lot that I'm most concerned Today, about. So I don't know if you guys can hear me. Yeah, we can Some... say, I think the Senator was speaking and then maybe you can speak after. Awesome. I... Okay. I you want to say hear, you to can't hear me. Tasha, I'm very sorry. I thank you very much for Hi, everyone. Can, can you guys hear me? Yeah, no, I didn't hear you. Yeah, I was going in and out. But Saeed, if you can do me one favor, just wait one moment. Uh, the senator was in the middle of a statement and then certainly you will be next. Okay, okay? thank you. Sorry. Thank you. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Senator. Oh, well, thank you. No, I mean, I, this stuff is just really important, really close to me. Um, you know, I spend a lot of time doing defense work and so I worked with a lot of young men, you know, in in this space. Uh, I worked in Dorchester. I worked in Roxbury. I worked in Suffolk downtown. Um, so, you know, the question for me is, you know, the gun thing. It's it's um, you know we got to do something national. I mean, it's a national problem. It's just a national problem, and and it's it's honestly, I think it's almost an unsolvable problem. The availability of guns because you have states where the politics is just completely different. I mean, I don't know what it takes to convince, you know, Colorado and Florida and places like that, you know, and, and even New Hampshire, they, they got to have tougher gun laws. Our gun laws are really pretty tight. I can't cite chapter and verse, but I think, you know, if, if somebody's gun is not accounted for and it ends up someplace, they, it's, they, they're going to have a difficult proof thing, but I'm open to, to legislation on that. But, but what else, what are the other ideas? What are the other ideas? I mean, I mean, that's, that's one. I'm, I'm, I'm putting it on my list. I'm thinking about it. But you know, it, it's valid to say, are you, do you do you have a reporting requirement that that would capture? I think that would capture some of the guns. But you know, those guys that go down to <laughs> South Carolina and come back with a box of guns, and and there's nothing we can do about that right now. Um, so I, I feel like that's just a that's a tough thing. But so what are the other things? I mean, what else? What else is on the list? What else, What are the other public policy solutions that that that, that you feel as you listen as as, you, as you've been through this? Uh, you know, thinking about this. Yeah, um, you know, you know, obviously background checks. I think Massachusetts has done a better job, and you can see, uh, you know, that that has uh, really paid off when you look at the statistics. Um, but uh, you know, there are many things, and again, there's frustration because whenever something happens, you know, folks talk and they say they're going to do something, and then uh, it just seems we're back to ground zero. So um, it's, it's frustrating, but we have to do something. Um, you know, I don't know if anybody else, or Saeed, I know you wanted to comment, but. Thank you, Rudy. Um, pleasure to be here. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Tasha, I'm very sorry for your loss. Um, thank you for sharing your story with us today. Um, 2006, the summer of 2006, uh, um, I attended a, a high school graduation um, event at the uh, Mission Hill Community Center. And uh, my friend and I left to meet later uh, for uh, a basketball uh, game at the park. A few hours later, he was gunned down. He was shot five times right next to Castle Square um, uh, projects. And uh, this kid was not involved in any gang, gang violence. He was not involved in any, um, you know, criminal activities. Uh, he was at the wrong place at the wrong time. So that was my first experience, my personal experience to losing someone, um, you know, to gun violence. And as the Senator earlier alluded, uh, said, uh, it's a national issue. And I, I, w I, I hope that, you know, we, we can find um, some common ground. If, if I give you guys a quick backstory about um, about me. I came to the U.S. Uh, 27 years ago as a refugee uh, here in Boston, um, you know, from Africa. And um, I lived in about five projects. 
um, throughout Boston. And um, this was the early 90s. And one of the things that I noticed was, you know, we sort of felt uh, neglected. Um, you know, there was not a lot of resources, um, you know, living in the projects. So we didn't have access to a lot of things. And, um, you know, most of my friends, they, they fell victim to the streets, um, you know, to, to do some, um, you know, gang activities, et cetera. Um, I got lucky. I was one of the lucky few people that, you know, found a, a mentor that was able to introduce to me, um, you know, um, IT and, and real estate. And, and ever since my life uh, has completely changed. One of the solutions I see is that, you know, as you guys heard, um, you know, the young man in, in the movie, you know, they said, you know, they don't want to live this life. It's just that, you know, they don't have a lot of options because if you're getting paid, let's say in Boston, $9 an hour, and you have a family to feed and family to take care of, you know, that's really not doing much for you. Um, you know, one solution that I see is that, you know, to provide them with, um, you know, skills that would give them the opportunity to get high paying jobs. And now, uh, since technology has interrupted a lot of things, uh, big companies like Google, Facebook, they don't require a four year degree anymore. You can go to a boot camp for about, you know, 90 to six months, 90 days to, you know, three months to, to, to six months and get a certificate. And you can work as an analyst, um, you know, as a programmer, and you can start off, you know, 70 to 80,000 a year. Um, I, I think that that would be a, a step in the right direction. And this year I'm running for uh, Boston City Council at large. And uh, one of the biggest policies that, you know, I'm gonna fight for is STEM programs because I, I live these issues and I did experience it. And I think that's gonna resolve a lot of things. Um, you know, if they get the opportunity or STEM programs to get high paying jobs. Um, thank you guys. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'll stick around to listen to everybody else's comments. Thank you, Saeed. Um, I see David, David Harris is back with us. Um, any, anyone else uh, wish to comment about this or any of the other uh, issues uh, that is depicted in the film or something that you'd like to speak about? I think this, I'm, I'm calling you from, uh, I live in Roxbury and uh, the film was very upsetting and, and, and painful to watch. And I think during the pandemic, what's come clear to me is just how segregated the society is and um, how much, I don't know, how, much, how hard it is to, you know, I, I live right in, right in the neighborhood and saw so many things that are right where I live. And I don't see that in a lot of ways. And I live right in the midst of it. And um, I, I just, I just, I just think it speaks to how the wealth gap in this country is devastating communities. Um, how, how much wasted life there is just. You know, all I see that they want is a meaningful life and to be loved and valued, which is what everybody wants. And, you know, even people with a lot of resources are having a hard time getting that. So it's, um, you know, it, I, I just think it caused me to open my eyes more uh, and my heart more. But, you know, a lot of people just don't don't have to see this. Yeah, if you live in Cambridge or Boston, it's right there. It's, uh, you know, these young men, because of a lack of opportunities, you know, they come from, you know, dysfunctional, dysfunctional homes. Trauma. Yeah, trauma. trauma. Real trauma. And, you know, there are organizations out there trying to help them. It's not easy work. It's difficult, but we need to do something. We just can't discard these young men because none of them chose to if they had a choice, would have chosen to do this. So I'm from, you know, I grew up in Roxbury and I grew up around, you know, uh, young men like this. So it has always, you know, stayed with me. 
that uh, you know what you see on the news isn't actually we need to delve further in to really understand and then try to find solutions so they they you know can uh, contribute to society and have the opportunities everybody else has. Um, so I, I definitely hear what you're what you're saying. So Rudy and folks, um, you know I'm sorry I'm sorry to kind of jump in here. I, and I'm sorry, Senator, I, I missed your your questions earlier, but uh, I see there's a there's a question in the chat. Um, and Senator Brownsburg is here because I asked him to come and I told him that I thought that all electeds should be here. And, and I continue to think that. <clears throat> the question is whether we've invited them. And I think, uh, you know, I, I invited some, I, I encourage us all to invite others. And, you know, if you think it's helpful, Senator, I, I, I hope you will do so too. Um, you know, one of the things, you know, that, I mean, look, I, the film is so powerful. It's very difficult to, 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 to uh, formulate really articulate kind of policy options, right? But I think that one of the things that we have to do is understand that we're talking about real lives here. Not, and we, we have to acknowledge that lives are being taken, but also that we're talking about uh, real lives, real families, with mothers who love their children, who, who you know, and that, uh, you know, I, I saw something else in the chat about gun control, and there was a big article in the Globe today about gun control. And you know, um, we need to address violence. And we need to confront it and understand it, and, and address it directly. Um, and we know how. You know, we know how to do that. Right? Uh, you know, the film gives us some clues, but there are also we need to think about what are we spending on violence prevention in, in this city. Um, what, what are the alternatives that we, that we can fund? Um, and, uh, you know, the, the research is out there. It's, it's, it's immense. Um, we, you know, we, Senator, not, you know, we've <laughs> talked about this. Um, but I do think there's a real question of political will. I mean, to me, what's fascinating is that the, you know, the, the kind of reaction we have to this really horrible, horrible, uh, shooting yesterday, um, and 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 the and the globe can talk about, you know, the first it's the first mass killing and since March 2020. Well, that's just not true. It's just not true. There have been mass killings. There have been shootings with three to four to five people killed in malls and theaters, but they've been black people. Right? Oh, yeah. You know, I know, yeah. you know. I mean, and so the idea that we need gun control when what we have is social control. We have the police using the search for guns as, a, as, as an excuse to harass and intimidate, uh, you know, people, people on the streets. So much so that the, mass, the Supreme Judicial Court has acknowledged and recognized that that, that that harassment and, and the indignities that young people face are, are severe enough that, that running from the police cannot be seen as an indication of guilt. That's our, so we, so we, we have these, we, we wanna pride ourselves in the Commonwealth on our, our gun control, but, but you know, as we talk about it right down the street, you know, our, our approach is, is a form of social control that breeds Distrust of police, and uh, so there's a real. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm rambling, but there is a political. There's a question of political will here. You know, we know so much about what we can do and what we should be doing, and this film really makes it clear what 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 we can accomplish if we put the resources to it. The question is, do we have the political will to ensure that? And that's why I want all all these electeds to see it. Hey, um, Brother oh, Daisy, um, if I could, you know, you raised the point that is that is um, paramount to the change that we need, right? Because in that film, you see all the disparities that affected every single one of the young brothers that 
uh, in the film, right? Whether their fathers were killed, whether their fathers went to prison, you know, moms had to do what she had to do to put food on the table, right? And even when Mid Janie today, as she was sworn in, and she brought back up the point of the the <laughs> the median income for the black and brown community in Boston is eight dollars, right? And so these are things I, I study and read a whole lot. But to your point about the political will, and this will answer your question as well, Senator Brown's brother. So I think about the constitution when it was written. And when it was written, it wasn't written with black and brown people in mind. When it said, you know, for all people, it wasn't talking about black and brown people. And so we've started the country on that basis. And so now we're here 2021 and we're facing all the different things that we're facing. And the reality is it's the foundation of the country because it's designed to do exactly what it's doing. And so here's something that I would propose. You know, I've been, you know, I've been thinking about running again, but it's not on my top list of anything right now. But I, I've built up a, a base over the years, you know, of doing the work that I do and just being who I am as a man of God. But here's something that I read today in Maldives, they changed their constitution. They made a new constitution. And what they did is they made Islam the only religion that matters in their country. And what I was thinking about the United States of America, because we have so many people from other countries here, you know, the black folks from Africa were bought over, but then there's many other people from other countries here, right? So imagine if we got together and fix the constitution so that it is equal, all men, all women created equal across the board at the table, putting things together that's gonna benefit the entire country, right? And, and the reason that I'm saying that is when you think about the men who penned the constitution, many of them had slaves. Many of them had slaves. So, you know, George Floyd dying last year, we have to ride that wave of unity. His death can't be in vain. And it's really with the legislators, you know, Congress, you know, mayors, senators, uh, city councils, re state representatives, right? If we really want to see change, if we really want to see young men and women not being killed, if we want to see people not being shot in malls, in stores, in spas, then we have to make that drastic change, you know? And yes, the change is gonna hurt because that's a transfer of power, right? That's, that's not even a transfer of power. What it's supposed to be is a equal power. And if we work on that, we can see some real change. With gun violence, with poverty, with homelessness, you know, the top three things that are plaguing our community with racism. If we do those things, we can work on some stuff and get some stuff done. So thank you again. Sorry I went in that direction, but that film is a exact result of how our country was founded. Thank you, Donald. <clears throat> and, and thank you, uh, Tony. I read in the chat, I really appreciate what you had to say. Yeah, Donald, let me say, I mean, I think, you know, look, <clears throat> you know, the constitution is a, is, a, is a strange beast. I mean, the constitution, I always say, you know, begins with that really beautifully crafted and elegantly stated, we the people. And as I say, we the people never included all of us, never did. 
So there, there are many, many constitutional questions and issues and things that we can say, but, but on the political will, the, 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 the issue really has to do with our ability to mobilize and organize people across the Commonwealth. Legislators can't act you know, in a vacuum. They need to, they need to hear from, from people from across the Commonwealth. And some of it, I think, uh, I'll tell you, a, a, lot of, a lot of developing that will has to do with the extent to which we can help people see things clearly. And some of it, and just, you know, again, I, 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 I hate to, well, it's not true. I love to pick on the globe. So, you know, so, so the globe, there was an article today about Mayor Walsh being, having, being kind of pained to leave Boston. And there was a throwaway line in there where it talked about his parents coming from Ireland and buying a home in Dorchester. And then later on, it talked about his current home being worth a million dollars. And Donald, when you talk about that $8 figure, $247,500 to eight. Right, that's, that's where we are. And then you have these throwaway lines in an article. So how many, how many of our parents and grandparents couldn't buy a house in Dorchester a generation ago, right? And, 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 and therefore don't have a million dollars in equity right now. And I mean, and I think we really have to get to a point where we can talk about it. so it's you know and this isn't an, an indictment really of the globe or the mayor but it has to do with our ability to be uh, 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 really sensitive and, and and alert to what's going on and what we're reading right uh, because it doesn't these things as you said these things don't just happen right it's it's part of this it's part of a structure of inequality that we've been living with for a long time. And the same thing, you know, in terms of the, the violence against Asian Americans, this is not new. It's, you know, um, you know this, this, this has been going on for, for, for at least a hundred years. Um, and so it takes some great event, but, but at what point do we have the kind of consistency and, and, and determination to organize and mobilize uh, for the long haul? It's not easy, right, Senator? I mean, you know, you can't, I mean. Uh... No, look, I mean, I feel like I, I want to say something about the Constitution. I want to go back a little bit because, I, and then to catch up with you. Um, I, I think that it's really important to remember that the Constitution is a living document and that in an enormous paroxysm of massive political will in, you know, the 1850s and 18. You know, and ultimately in the Civil War, we changed the Constitution. We we said everybody's equal, and, and that includes everybody. So we we the you know this this nation has fought a huge battle to say those principles should be that everybody's equal. We already did that part. We got the Constitution is pretty good, but there's a long way from laws and constitutions to real equality. And you know that's. That's where I think we have the work to do. So I, mean, I think for me, it's 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 a it's a continuous struggle to go beyond what what's on paper now, because it is on paper now. Everybody's equal: race, creed, uh, gender. You know, all those things. You, you, everybody's included. Women didn't vote back then either, and they're included now. Um, and ben, by the way, people didn't white men who didn't have property didn't vote back then. Uh, you know, so you know there, there was there was a hierarchy back then, which yeah it was those those uh you know those plantation owners and so forth who were kind of running the show but you know a lot of people have come a long way uh under the law since then and we should never forget that because it's very significant and a lot of people died to, to achieve that um but now the so now we still have another 150 years of work to do um I and mean, it's in so that i'm not i'm i'm agreeing with you dave when you say there's a lot of work to do i just want i just want to pick up that constitution thing because we got to remember that uh, that the people have come a long way i mean legally not there's not big huge problems but the uh, the fight was there was a huge fight in this country. So if this country can mobilize itself. Uh, you know the political will can be achieved. Um, I think people have to have clarity about what the uh, 
what we're what we what we need to do. And that's where they that's where it starts to break down um, because there's not a consensus on on what the answers are. And I'm hearing gun control and I'm hearing, you know, but, but I think it goes well beyond that. I mean, I think it's 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 well things and so forth. So that's. I'm all about trying to define that agenda um, with you. I wonder if we could also just acknowledge, um, I mean, and we have been this evening about the role of um, kind of the domestic life and, and, and of the women in this film. And I think Tasha's story, uh, uh, Tasha's story as mother. And, you know, I could hear in her testimony, a defense of, but I raised my son well, we, we, we went to church every, he was walking to his grandpa's house. Like that shouldn't be her burden to defend that, right? And we need to think about not just the gun control, not just the drug policing, but also the housing conditions, the environmental conditions that make COVID more at risk for, for African-American communities, you know, healthcare policies, some really core domestic quality of life that takes the burden and the trauma off of the mothers um, that are trying to hold our communities together. Um, yeah, I think it just, and I, I thank you again, Tasha, for your presence tonight and um, your ability to, to be here with us despite um, your pains. Thank you. Thank let, you. Me add my, let me add my thanks on that, Tasha, for sharing what is, I know, very deep. Thank you very much. I appreciate everybody. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to say thank you, Sarah. Thank you, David. I know the uh, Charles Hamilton Houston uh, Center for Race and uh, Justice is really going to miss you. Um, well, that's the cat's not out of the bag yet. No, don't be saying that oh, out loud. OK, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I take it back. <laughs> we'll edit that out. Yeah, yeah. No, well, that, well you, your secret is safe. Yeah. So you know, but Rudy, you know, look, you know, at, at, you know, we feel and we feel strongly. I mean, I've said this to you before, and I say this from my heart. And Tasha and Donald and all, everybody, you know, Malik. I mean, this this film is so critical for us. Um, and and Sarah, to your point, and Tasha. I mean, you know, one of the things that I I find uh, most distressing is the tendency not to see our families as 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 comparable to other families. I mean, there are our, our you know our our parents love us, um, uh, want to protect us, um, nurture us, and um, you know as you see we you know go to the end of the earth for for us. And and I'm and what worries me is that in the public's mind I'm not sure that that registers. Uh, they see, they see young men, or they see certain kind of behaviors, and they categorize them, and and that allows them not to see the basic humanity. Uh, and that really is, is the thing about this film, I think, uh, th that that is so powerful. Um, and uh, you know, I will say, I mean, I I, I can't just I, I'll say I, I, I'll engage a little bit on the constitutional question. And, and I will say as well that the 15th Amendment gave us the right to vote, but in 1965, we still needed a Voting Rights Act. Oh, yeah, I'm with yes. you there. I'm so, with you there. I'm so a, so I'm the not... Constitution, you know, which was then, uh, has since been, you know, kind of carved back. We need, and, we need, there's a lot we need to fight about. I'm not disagreeing with you there. I'm not uh, disagreeing with you. There's not, not a lot of work we need to do. I'm saying that. But I think you know when, when we're talking about constitutional convention of forgetting that that you know a huge war was fought, you know, and lots of people died uh, yeah. to, to you know to 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 achieve what we did in that, and then then there's still more work to do. So right, and John Lewis scared. got cracked in the head to get the Boeing Rights Act. Yeah. I know. Oh yeah. You know, um, hey, um, can I can I just add something else? Because I think I think to your point, David. Um, you know, this is this is something that one of the young men said in the film, right? He talked about always having to look over his shoulder, you know, to make sure he could get home or get where he was going. And then you hear, you know, my, my sister Tasha, 
saying how she raised her son, right? And then I remember hearing Trayvon Martin's dad speak. And he said about his son, he said it didn't matter what picture they tried to paint about his son, but he knew what kind of son he raised as well, right? Yeah. And then I think about myself, you know, I do this work every day, every day. And here's something different between me and my white brother. When I walk out the door, it's not a guarantee for me to make it home. It's not a guarantee, but for my white brother, he doesn't have the same struggle I have. And, and what my point is, and is this something that David, that Robert Lewis said in the film, we didn't get to hear this last part, but when he was talking about guns, shootings, violence, and he said, if we didn't get a handle on it, it was gonna trickle into other neighborhoods. He said this back in 2014. And so we're seeing it. We're seeing more violence, shootings everywhere in the country. We are the worst country out of all the countries when it comes to the violence with the guns. And so if, and, and I'm just, and I'm saying this now because I, I feel like, you know, I've been having these conversations a whole lot and I work with these young people and I know the passion that they have. I know that their families love them to David's point, but if it's not your story, Sometimes it's just not that important, you know, and, I, and I'll use this here, right? My, me and my wife, we have seven children, right? Between us, my wife birthed four sons. And while she was carrying a baby, I still can't identify with the change in her body. I still can't identify with the pain. I can't identify with any of the pregnancy except maybe eating what I was sharing with her and when I was going to the store for her, but I really can't identify with that process. So until we have that type of empathy from our white brothers and sisters, I have to say it like that today, because y'all have the power to make the change. It's about if you're willing to make the change, because what that means now that we'll be like this, instead of like this. I'm a man of God, 24 seven, good day, bad day, right? And so when I'm saying what I'm saying, trust me, it's bothering me, it's bothering God who looks down from heaven on all of us, doesn't care what your religion is, or any of that, because there's only one God. And you have the power to make that change. I like you. I remember when I met you, I don't know if you remember that day when I came, when I was running for Senate and I decided to come meet everybody that was in the state house, just in case I won. Either way, I wanted to, people to know me as a person and I still live like that every day. And I know that inside of you is good. And I know that the fight is hard, but we have to be willing to lose our lives for some things that matter. And that's where we're at. These young people's lives matter. Those people in Boulder, their lives matter. Those people in Atlanta, their lives matter. Those yeah. people in Dorchester, their lives matter. Yes. So that's what's up today. That's where I'm at. You know, it's no more time for the seeing the elephant in the room and not talking about it. Let's have the conversation. And if you're really about to change, you know, I can galvanize some people if you put something on the table that needs to be done. But that's where we are today. So I just needed to get that out. Because I appreciate that. No I appreciate. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I mean, ultimately, you know, I'm, I'm in the same place. For me, the Black Lives Matter thing is a is a is a message of love, which is that we want to lift up every single life in this country, and you know, we want to recognize the trauma, the harm, the pain, and 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 what's going on, and find ways to address it. Um, and so I'm, I'm hearing that. I'm feeling that. I, I go to bed thinking about that every night. Honestly, I mean, it's really. This, this is this is the conversation. Um, and the question is, you know, what's the path? What's the path? And um, I'm, I'm, I'm listening, I'm struggling with that question. What's the path? 
because if we had a path, if we, if we knew the path for sure, I think there's a lot of things we know to do, and I, and I, you know, and we, we want to keep trying to do them. Uh, but um, globally, you know, what what's the next step? I'm, I'm I'm all about having that conversation. You know, we're doing we're doing more on education. We're trying to do more on education. We, every year we do a new gun control bill of some kind. Um, and we think we did something with police reform. I'm not saying it solves these problems. It doesn't. I think there's a lot of work to be done there. I think I think David, you know, I feel if if there's one thing I definitely feel reinforcement on from this film is is the message of look, you need trusted youth working organizations that are not tied in with the police. Um, that I really that I really feel. I really get that. And and by the way, money where my mouth is. I I I put money in the budget for the two. Uh, for youth workers in the two projects that uh, that are in my district, where there where there's where there's issues emerging, actually, for there's three, for three projects. Um, so we're we're I'm trying to do that locally, and I know it's a conversation that goes well beyond uh, my district or any other the other one place. And but so I'm with that, and I'm with the issue of all different kinds of responses other than policing. And so there's a lot of different ways we're feeling away. You know we. Uh, I think those are budget issues. I'm, I'm, I've articulated some things I want to do in the budget and other people are doing that as well to say, what can we do to create new models of intervention uh, in, re, in emergency response? I mean, the use worker thing is, is an independent thing, but when somebody calls 911, who goes out? That's another question. Um, is it a police response? Is it something else? Um, so I'm just saying uh, a lot of work to do. I want to keep the conversation going because we got to figure it out. Uh, we appreciate you showing up. I mean, that's that's uh, that's that's huge. And uh, it's just it's it, it, you know it, it's it's only a start. I, I know. I well, it. it's a start, but but you're here. I mean, and so you know, look, I'm telling you, I've told you before. You know, I've said you know, you and I, you know, we've had this conversation before. You know, I do I do want all your colleagues to see this. So I'll you know fit, try to work with you and see if we can figure out a way to to have I'll a have this, we, in the state house. You know? We can do that. You know what? Tell you what, I. I I'm pretty sure I could. Uh, we could organize something like that. Um, I think it would be. I think it'd be a good idea. No, I, I, I would love that. So we'll yeah. co-sponsor it or do anything we can, you know. And I'm sure that that Rudy and Donald will show up. But but I do think, you know. So I mean, you shouldn't be out here on loan. <laughs> yeah. What whatever we need to do, um, you know, we're available. That's why we made the film. Not just you know again. Try not to sugarcoat anything, but the goal was to humanize these young people and to, it. yeah, to, to kind of show the incredible heroic work being done by street workers and social workers out there. And they're real solutions. It's not simple, it's complicated, but the solutions are, are there. So thank you. And again, really appreciate everyone showing up because it means you care and you want to learn. Well, um, I'll look back to you, David. I'm gonna, um, okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to some people about what we can okay. put together. No, I appreciate it, and you know, just let, let me know, and I, I can produce Rudy if we, if we need to. If, you know, if they, if, if if you and I can't persuade them, you know, Rudy's charm can win them over. <laughs> <laughs> I'll work on that. I'm, I'm ready to work on that. Okay. All Great. Right. Thank you. I appreciate that. So I can't imagine, Sarah, a better note for us to, to you know, I mean, again, to everybody here, um, you know, these conversations, you know, these, the, these, these screenings are accomplishing what we want to accomplish. And it's really every time we're able to, to facilitate these conversations, uh, you know, I think and I hope that we all gain something from them. And I know I do. And um, and, and I really am thankful for the ability to share this time and space with, with you all. So, Sarah, Rudy, Donald, Tasha, anything else? Uh, no, again, thank you so much. And I just put my email in the chat if anybody wants to communicate. But thank you again, Sarah and David and everyone who showed up tonight. Thank you so much. And maybe what we can even plug at the uh, end of May, we're hoping to have a sneak preview of the newer, newest production that Rudy is working on. So 
Um, and that is about the, the community, the Boston community during uh, the pandemic and how that's affected neighborhoods. So with this continuing this conversation of what are the, the predeterminants of health um, and, uh, and equity. So yeah, yeah, thank you, Sarah. And it's also entertaining. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> yeah, I needed to do something there, but it's about black barbershops and hair salons and how, uh, what they've meant to, to communities, black neighborhoods for decades, but also uh, we're kind of filming how they're dealing with COVID and the pandemic and as small black businesses. So uh, I hope to share some of that in May. Thank you. And don't forget, Madison be Madison. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay, the check's in the mail, Davis. <laughs> yeah, thank oh, you. Is, uh, no, no, these are all great. All this, the whole body of work. Yeah, thank you so much. We've been fortunate to get national attention for Boston stories, which resonate across the country. So just fortunate as a filmmaker and with the team we have to be able to tell stories. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I, I wonder what I, I need to be doing, and sometimes that uh, work reminds me that I need to be listening, you know, and, I, and how do I build that my capacities is, is listening as well to, it, to your stories, to hearing, and then to taking that in. So um, thank you for, for that, really. Um, thank you. Make us all stronger. Thank you. Okay. Have a good evening, everyone. All right, folks. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Thank you, Senator.